real with you guys. These movies were a big obsession of mine when I was 10 years old. They were the shit for me. And there goes all of the ad revenue. Not that we have any anyway. Bye! And yes, it was my first 15 rated film. Rebellious child. Not really. My parents let me watch it. I took these films very seriously and frankly I didn't notice how silly and over the top they could be. And of course, all of the innuendo went right over my innocent little head for years. I had never seen these films, but I had heard of them, I think. Ye olde memory be a wee bit fuzzy. So, because of how much detail we kind of go into with these films, I'm giving a full spoiler warning now as we pretty much are going to tell you the entirety of the plot. <laughs> Charlie assigns his angels, Natalie, Alex and Dylan, the task of finding kidnapped entrepreneur and tech genius Eric Knox, believed to have been kidnapped by Roger Corwin, his business rival. The angels chase after a thin man seen in the surveillance tapes and discover Knox. Knox and Vivian Wood, his business partner, charge the angels with investigating Corwin and his company Red Star to see if he's stolen their technology. As they do this, they place Knox under their protection to prevent him from being harmed further. Not long after they bug the company's mainframe, attacks are made on the Angels and Bosley, Charlie's assistant, is kidnapped. Knox is revealed to have been the true mastermind, with his motivation being that he wanted to kill Charlie, who he believes to be the murderer of his father. He had Corwin taken out because he could, and with his satellite, he could use his voice recognition software to locate the mysterious Charlie. The Angels obviously thwart his plan and then go on vacation while the agency is rebuilt. The girls return for another mystery. Two rings that have in the encrypted data of the Witness Protection Program are stolen. It's up to the Angels to recover them. At the same time, they find some of the data has been sold with one person in the program being assassinated by a surfer and another being targeted. After they save Leo, Helen Zaz is found to be one of the other targets. Helen is Dylan's birth name. Her ex-boyfriend, gang leader, Seamus O'Grady, is released and is given the rings in order to bait her into a confrontation. The angels continue their investigation, recover the rings, and discover the truth. They stop the villain, an ex-angel called Madison Lee, and things appear to be looking up for Natalie and Alex's civilian lives, with Dylan comforted that her found family with the girls isn't over just yet. There's only one way to get through undetected. Be invisible. Natalie Cook is the blonde, happy-go-lucky girl who is a little ditzy and clumsy, although not when working. Literally, you'd have me believe that this badass agent who cares about dating a cute guy when on the job and gets wrapped up in balloons and falls over when she can do motorbike stunts and complex kung fu. I guess the persona does help in people being put off guard with her because she's just a cute silly blonde who's flirting with them. She's actually very clever and talented, but they try to make her seem like the everyman and normal, with a lot of focus on her love life with Pete. Long dance numbers tend to be dedicated to Natalie, which I just don't get. I guess she dreamt about being a dancer at one point, kind of implied in movie one, but the whole sequence at Pete's school reunion was just bizarre. How did these random strangers know to dance with her and then she suddenly disappeared through the crowd to be caught by Pete at the end, as everyone cheers? We never really meet any of Natalie's family or anyone else from her past, leaving her to be a bit of a blank slate, only having the girls, her job, and Pete. You know, they come on all lovey-dovey until they find out I can shatter a cinder block with my forehead. Alex Monday is very much depicted as a stereotypically perfect Asian in her backstory, though in the present she has some flaws, like not being able to cook well. She was a talented gymnast and horse rider, chess champion and astronaut, with her father wanting her to go into medicine. Her civilian problem in both films is based around her lying about her occupation. It's resolved very quickly with Jason, her boyfriend, who is a famous actor, but with her father, there's constant misunderstanding as he thinks she's a prostitute or escort. By the way, that went over my head as a kid. I just thought he was worried about her since her job is very dangerous. A lot of her disguises tend to give her a whip, which is kind of weird that they're trying to make her some kind of dominatrix. But then I guess the audience may then get where her dad is coming from with his assumption. It's just always nice seeing bits of Alex's life, but there's 
still a lot that's confusing since we have no idea how she came to be in a relationship with Jason and why they're suddenly on break in the second film, why she is one of the main cast, the films more often than not focus more on Natalie and Dylan's stories than Alex's. He's great. He's the bad guy. Dylan Saunders is the rebellious tough girl with a rocky past. Dylan clearly wants stability in her life, and after her rebellious teen years, she tried to become a police officer, which didn't work out. She adores her job as an angel. Most of the time when Dylan is focused on in the movies, it's because she's fallen in love with a bad guy. She doesn't get much focus on her backstory until the second movie, as a huge part of the whole plot revolves around her ex-boyfriend. The only mention of her family in the first movie was the mention of her having an absent father whom she never met, and a dead mother. I'm guessing they had several missions in between the two movies, considering by the second it's an inside joke for the angels that she falls in love with villains. The only time she's in love with a relatively normal guy is when she's with Chad, a weird sailor who lives on his boat. Personally, I would say Dylan was better used in the second film, as she had more stakes in the plot than just being the girl who falls for the bad guy and wants to meet her father figure in the first movie. Excuse me, I have to take a phone call. <laughs> Bosley was a mixed bag in the movies. In movie one, Bill Murray's Bosley wasn't very good as a character. He wasn't funny, and when he was out in the field, he didn't come off as very professional, so I'm surprised that Corwin didn't kick him out for being weird. He was literally acting like he was miked. He just doesn't come across as a competent agent, so he's better off staying at home and answering Charlie's calls. Bernie Max Bosley was much better. His issues revolve around him being very new to the job, but he helps the angels out on location, almost like a fourth angel. So you can forgive him for being out of his depth and not being a professional agent like the girls. Plan B does stand for Plan Bosley for this guy. The best part really about the films is the camaraderie between the angels. They make good friends for one another and are a great team. I did like that the angels didn't use guns because it meant they had to creatively get out of situations and fight hand to hand instead of having a shootout. Some of the action scenes do end up being over the top, but they can be enjoyable if you just don't care about the realism. It is a film after all. It was a little dub that nearly all solutions tended to revolve around the angels making themselves super sexy, melting the brain cells of guys. While it's empowering that they have control of their sex appeal, it doesn't look good for male viewers since a lot of male characters are just kind of brain dead because of legs, midriffs and amiable faces. Alex's Jason and Natalie's Pete are nice characters and give some insight into the respective angels' civilian lives, with Natalie starting a new life with Pete and Alex being able to land a celebrity boyfriend. However, Jason is very underused, especially in movie 2, to the point that he's not really worth being there as a character. Pete has a bit more focus, but I suppose that's probably because the films try to make Natalie appear as the main character. I found them to be very heavy on the girl power, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. However, I found them to be a bit ridiculous at some points, like the whole thing with them all being very accomplished ladies that Charlie hired to basically be assassins and rescuers, detectives even, as it is them that figure out who the bad guy is most of the time. Why would they walk away from such promising and well-paying careers just to work for Charlie? What benefits do they gain? How much do they get paid compared to what they could earn? As a film, the first one is better as the plot is much more cohesive and you can see how things progress. The second plot is very all over the place and it's stuffed to the brim with too many characters. You could have easily done two separate films, focusing on having Seamus O'Grady and Madison Lee as separate villains instead of sloppily sticking both into the same plot. They didn't have a link with one another, apart from Madison using O'Grady to further her strange and relatively unmotivated plot. She hated Charlie so she was going to sell witness protection data? At least Knox made sense in wanting to kill him directly. In the second film, I was really disappointed with the villains. One was the leader of a gang, and the other a former angel. I was more disappointed with the former angel than the gang leader, because at least he seemed to be able to inspire some fear into all the angels. And I realised I was disappointed in the villains of the first film, too. They were just shit! Ah uh, yes, let me pretend to get kidnapped, get rescued, bang an angel, reveal my whole plan, and then kill her. Nah, mate, she survived. Mwahahaha, I was the bad guy the whole time, and you fell for it. Ha 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 ha! No. You're shit. You don't even stick around when you order your henchmen to kill her to make sure they do the fucking job. That's bad guy 101, dumbass. Don't dance out of the room like you've won when anything could damn well happen in that room. Are you sure you can trust your men? 
Are you sure she's not going to escape? No, but you're a moron! I get his motives to some extent. Want to destroy a rival, ruin some lives, get rich, yada yada. It's the usual shit, really, which is why I was disappointed in him. Just one big meh. In the first film, I was against the thin man because he was, really, not that relevant and his only two definitive traits were that he was thin and he screamed instead of talking. Oh, and his fascination with hair. Ah, that's three. Hair fetish. <laughs> I will concede that he was a fabulous assassin with the air of menace about him. In the second film, his backstory was revealed a bit more and I found myself almost pitying him. Almost. He turned out not to be such a bad guy in the end and almost forms a relationship with one of the angels. If it wasn't for douchebag Mac, I'm gonna stab you off a building, I think they would have made a nice couple in the end. It's kind of weird though that they pair him off with Dylan considering he was obsessed with Alex's hair in the first film. Dylan had enough extra elements in this film and adding an additional love interest just to kill him off just wasn't needed. They're definitely time capsules of the 2000s. Over the top, loud, sexy, filled with innuendo with cameos from the big stars of the time. Overall, I did enjoy the films and found myself laughing with Lime as we watched them. I could see why a 10 year old Lime was so into these. They would have been even more awesome back in the day, though now they are a tad dated in both effects and language. Though this does not mean they cannot be enjoyed. Mm -hmm. Would we recommend the films? Yes, because they're a fun romp where you can watch some beautiful ladies solve crime and kick ass, as long as you turn your brain off for a little for all the silliness. And also, let's not forget some of the uh, yikes moments. Well, the massage place for one. Oh, the belly dancing. Oh, yeah. Definitely from the 2000s, these films. The chat is stuck. Anyway, thank you for watching. Like and subscribe. We love you very much for all that. Comment your own thoughts about the films if you've seen it. That's all. Lime out. Dragon out. Don't forget to support us on Patreon if you wish. Link will be in the description below. Become one of our most fabulous beans and eventually get your name featured on these end credits. The dance of Patreon. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It's the dance of Patreon. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It's the dance of Patreon. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, yes, we did technically just steal the dance of Italy. Love you, Mark and Eve. <laughs> Join our Patreon, baby, and become a nice little bean. See ya!